the trouble started right here at 17th and Maple in the home of Harvey Donald. The trouble might be better described as a dangerous trend, dangerous to the local packer dealer. You see, Harvey Donald has lived in this house for about 20 years. With him live his wife and a grown son. They live comfortably because Donald is the best insurance salesman in town and has a wide circle of clients and friends. Matter of fact, in this neighborhood in Gladstone Heights, Harvey Donald is a highly respected man. His neighbors, good middle-class people, not only ask for his advice, they usually follow it. It's natural in a way that Mrs. Donald is influential too. Her clothes are imitated, her manners admired, and her opinions adopted. Well, you get the idea. In this street, the Donalds set the standard. And that's one reason why this neighborhood was almost solid Packard territory. The Donalds had bought Packards for years, and the neighborhood usually followed suit. So, over the years, Jim Fallon, the local Packard dealer, had come to regard the Donald neighborhood as a symbol of stable Packard business. Since Harvey Donald was its keystone, he deserved and received Fallon's best attention. Jim had no suspicion of trouble. On this particular morning, he sat down, went through his mail, and found the usual things. It seemed like just another morning. But suddenly, suddenly he got an awful shock. It was a note from Frank Prindle, one of his salesmen. Jim read it several times and couldn't quite believe it. Harvey Donald is switching to Buick. I'll see you about it this afternoon. It couldn't be. Yet there it was. If Donald switched to Buick, it might start a trend, a dangerous trend. Fallon was stunned. But not for long. He got on the phone to arrange an emergency meeting. And later that day, they met. Frank Prindle and Ken Mitchell, Fallon's two salesmen, and Neil Larson, head of the service department. The atmosphere was tense as Fallon summed up. So we can't lose Donald. He's a kind of a symbol to me, and by heaven, if we can't hold him, we can't hold anybody. And we've got to hold him, even if we have to try everything in the book. What do you think, Neil? I can't figure it, Jim. Donald hasn't had service trouble. He's been in for checkups a few times, and we've handled him with kid gloves. Always have. Look, I've handled Harvey Donald for ten years, and I know how to handle him. If I've made a mistake, I certainly don't know what it is. Try everything in the book, Jim. I have. I tell you it's something else. He likes the new model. I even have the feeling he'd like to buy it. But he goes dead on me and says Buick. I don't know. Why not put Ken on it, Jim? He might see something I'm blind to. Ken, what about it? But Frank is tops, Mr. Fallon. What can I do that he hasn't? Yes, Frank Prindle was an old hand, a good salesman. What could Ken do that Frank hadn't done? Nobody knew. But Ken got the assignment anyway. He felt a tingle of excitement about it. This was his chance, but he must move fast and he must move systematically. And that night he started. Had Frank Prindle done everything in the book? Well, the first thing to do was to check the book. What were the fundamentals of the selling process anyhow? They broke down to five basic steps. One, create a willingness to listen. Two, know your product. Three, Create a desire to own. Four, remove objections. And five, close the deal. Now, what does all that mean? To begin with, the prospect is usually a busy man with many calls on his attention. It's up to you to catch his attention and focus it on Packard. You must, in other words, create a willingness to listen. National advertising begins the job. The salesman carries through with direct mail, sales associates, and the personal approach. Once you've got his attention, you can't hold it with double talk. To hold his attention, you've got to know your product will satisfy his needs. In other words, 
know your product. That means knowing your car, knowing competitive cars, and knowing why your car is better. With this knowledge, you can create the desire to own. This is the crucial step. Match your product to his needs and do it so well that he wants to buy. That buying urge is best stimulated by the product itself. First, in the showroom. Here, the appearance features, skillfully interpreted, begin the real selling job. But since a car is a vehicle, the most convincing job is done in the demonstration on the road. Here, your claims are translated in terms of performance. Here is where the car proves itself. Nothing is more important. So, in big letters, your most important job is to stimulate the buying urge. That is done most effectively, one, in the showroom, and two, on the road. Now, remember this. Nobody likes to part with money. Even though the prospect wants to buy, the thought of parting with money will stimulate all kinds of objections, real and fancy. So you do an important selling job when you meet objections. To do this successfully, find the real objection. Show your respect for it. Prove it baseless and sell the strong points. Everything you do is aimed at this moment, the payoff. If you do your job well, the close is pretty certain. But it's not automatic. You must build up to it. To close the deal, aim for it constantly. Get the prospect to agree often. Ask for the order often and assume he will buy. And that was that, the ABC of the selling process. Ken had found no clue to what Frank Prindle had left undone. The truth was Frank had taught Ken a great deal. He not only knew the ABC, he practiced it. Ken was left with no clue at all. Ken's wife, Kay, came in after a while. She knew what the situation was, and she sympathized. But she thought it was time for bed. Why not wait till morning, big shot? You look tired. I've only got a week or so to swing this deal. And don't call me big shot. I don't like it. Hmm, you do need some sleep. Uh... Tell me, are we buying that suit for you tomorrow? You promise We! Me? We! We! Why can't I buy my own clothes? Must you always take me by the hand? Now, Ken, you know you always go in for those loud, flashy suits. Mr. Fallon doesn't like it, and I won't allow it. Huh. Listen, if Fallon knew how henpecked I am, he'd fire me. All right, all right, big shot. Don't get excited. His wife probably has to take care of him, too. Husbands have to be henpecked. Heaven help us all. Ken, a typical husband, retired from the field. But as he sat there, for no apparent reason at all, he remembered something Frank Prindle said that afternoon. I tell you, it's something else. He likes the new model. I even have the feeling he'd like to buy it. But he goes dead on me. Kay? Kay? Kay, an idea. I've got an idea. Are you crazy yelling at this time of night? Well, Kay carried him off struggling, idea or no idea. But early the next morning, Ken started like a cyclone. As soon as he got into work... Now think, Frank. Mrs. Donald. How much did Mrs. Donald have to do with buying these cars? Not a thing, Ken. Mr. Donald wears the pants in that family. Oh, she comes along on demonstrations, but not a peep out of her. Come to think of it, she didn't even come on the last one. Say, what are you driving at? Frank, who do you think buys my suits? <laughs> Why, you do. That's what you think. Ken whisked to the phone as Prindle, bewildered, sat in a daze. Then Prindle heard a voice. Don't be stubborn, Frank. That's a perfectly lovely suit. Yep. Brindle got the idea, too. But Ken was already working on it. He was calling Gladys Calhoun, beauty parlor operator. 
Ken Mitchell. I thought you were married. Oh, oh, business. Mm-hmm. Okay, lunch at Marvin's. And at lunchtime, she did meet Ken. Now, Gladys, what about Mrs. Donald? Do you work on her? Every Thursday at 10.30. Shampoo, wave, and manicure. Well, uh, what kind of person is she? You know, her tastes, personality, and so on. Oh, strictly the lady type. I know. I put bright red nail polish on her once by mistake. And when she saw that, she made me take it right off. Well, Ken got all the information he could. Gladys became Ken's sales associate, and he gave her some instructions. Then the wheels started to turn. The next time Mrs. Donald visited the beauty salon, Gladys turned the talk to her boyfriend. He, it seems, was scrimping. And after all the scrimping and saving, what does he buy? A small, cheap car. You can tell he'll never be in the Gladstone Heights crowd. Why, Gladys, what do you mean? Oh, you know, packet people. I must say there's something about a packet. Well, as a matter of fact, Gladys, I'm set on a Buick this year. A Buick? Oh, for heaven's sake, what's wrong with the Buick? Oh, nothing wrong with it, Mrs. D. It's just that I somehow think of y'all as packet people. If you know what I mean. Yes, Gladys was a smooth operator. She set a wave in Mrs. Donald's hair and a thought in her mind. Nor was it an accident when later in the day, Joe complimented Mrs. Donald on how well a Packard held its good looks. Wasn't this the time of year Mr. Donald got his new Packard? And when Mrs. Donald mentioned Buick, Joe looked almost hurt at the idea. Don't get me wrong, Mrs. Donald. Buick's a real flashy car, all right, but, well, anyway, it isn't a Packard. And that's how another sales associate planted a seed. Ken had them spotted all over. Wherever Mrs. Donald went, somebody said something or other to start her thinking. Then Ken moved in. He sent a piece of direct mail which described the new Packard and a personal note inviting her to come down and see it. When Ken figured she had received them, he started the direct approach with a phone call. He dialed Mrs. Donald's number and waited. He was so excited he could hardly breathe. Hello? Oh, Mr. Mitchell. Yes, I received your note. Thank you. But Mr. Donald has seen your new cars, and we're pretty well decided on a Buick. I'm sorry, Mr. Mitchell. Oh, no, no, Mr. Mitchell. We've no complaint. But, well, frankly, we've had package for such a long time that we'd like to try something different this year. I can certainly appreciate that, Mrs. Donald. That's why I'd like you to see the latest Packard. It's new from the tires up. Different in every possible way. Really? My husband didn't mention that. But, Mr. Mitchell, what's the good of my coming down? My husband is out of town, and he has to make the decision. Of course, Mrs. Donald. But I'm sure Mr. Donald relies a great deal on your good taste. Besides... The new Packard has so many features which only a woman can really appreciate. She didn't want to admit it, but Gladys and Joe had disturbed her. Besides, Ken's approach was so courteous. He turned her objections aside so deftly that she just couldn't turn him down. Then, too, like most women, she was curious. She was going to be downtown anyway, so she said yes. Next day at 2 o'clock. Jubilation reigned. Ken had carried the first step. But it was only the first. The next thing was to plan his showroom demonstration. Which points he was going to emphasize on which particular car. Then Ken found out something. It seems the Donalds had always bought a medium-priced model and settled in cash. 
So it was decided that Ken should try to sell up to a custom, maybe. The Donald's income, like most other people's, had gone up. After Ken had reviewed the car and planned just what to say, he thought of Mrs. Donald, the kind of person she was, and precisely what appeal, what angle would be most effective. The next day at two, Ken was primed. He couldn't afford a single fumble on this sale, not one. He'd begin by meeting her at the door and, but here she was. Mrs. Donald? Why, yes, are you? I'm Mr. Mitchell. Oh. I'm so glad you came. I think you'll be very happy you decided to. <laughs> You're optimistic, Mr. Mitchell. Optimistic? Well, with a packet to sell, why not? I'm sure you'll like it. Ken's courtesy, his manner, and his optimism all had their effect. He led Mrs. Donald to the precise point where the car showed to its best advantage. Knowing her desire for something different, he began. I know you're accustomed to the fact that a Packard is always a beautiful car, Mrs. Donald, but this year it's beautiful in a completely different way. Notice, for example, how modern the lines are. Modern, but not extreme. People of good taste are never extreme, and we design for people of good taste. Now, it is beautiful, isn't it? Mmm, yes. And I'm surprised it's so different. It really is. Uh, well, it's not only different, it's better in dozens of ways. Let me show you. So Ken took her first to the front of the car. Grill work, headlights, hood and radiator ornament, he decorated with words. Lovely, graceful, skillfully designed, and so on. Next, he showed her the side view. And pointing out details, he painted bright impressions in her mind. She heard the words sleek, flowing line, gleaming, striking. She heard a bright adjective for every detail. After Ken described the back of the car, he let her raise the trunk lid herself to show how easily it was done. He highlighted for her the trunk's spaciousness and accessibility. Then, he said, We have this particular model for immediate delivery in either blue, black, or maroon. Possibly you would prefer the blue or maroon. How right you are. Mr. Donald thinks black is the only color in the world. But you know, I rather like blue. I'm sorry we don't have a blue model on the floor. But I can show you the exact shade of blue. And when you place the order, we'll have it for you. Notice that? When you place the order, Ken assumed all along that she would buy, or at least he gave the impression that he was confident she would. He began to offer her choices, but she didn't bite. So, at the front door, he made two points. The thickness of the door provided extra safety, and the efficient body seals meant clean upholstery. He moved quickly from cleanliness and safety to beauty, the beauty of expertly tailored fabrics in harmonized color tones. After a bout of beauty, he interpreted the front compartment in terms of spaciousness, comfort, and driving ease. But he didn't do all the talking. He asked questions, brought out objections. For instance... Oh, yes, it's a simply gorgeous instrument panel. I love the design, Mr. Mitchell, but... How on earth can you tell if a key is connected or disconnected? So Ken worked the keys and explained about the indicator lights. He deftly handled every objection, no matter how small. Well, by the time they left the front compartment, Ken had drawn her attention to the new ventilation system, the black lighted instruments, and every other feature. All were translated in terms of comfort. Her comfort, her safety and her family's. When she sat in the back seat, Ken made her feel like a queen. He made it appear almost incredible that so much luxury and so much comfort could be had for so little. She had the feeling that every light, armrest, assist cord, and ashtray, that the whole car had been specially designed and built for Mrs. Harvey Donald. And by this time, the Buick seemed far away. Ken watched every expression on her face. When he thought she was ready, Ken crossed his fingers and said, 
as you said, Mrs. Donald, Mr. Donald has to make the final decision. Well, Mr. Prendle couldn't find out exactly why Mr. Donald objected to the car. Frankly, we've all been puzzled. This car not only looks like a thoroughbred, it acts like one. Don't you think we could win him over if I took both of you for a ride in a new car? As soon as he returns, of course. Well, candidly, I was the one who wanted to change, Mr. Mitchell. But this Packard is a change. You've satisfied me perfectly. But there's another person, my son. My son had some mechanical reason for wanting to change. I don't understand it at all, but perhaps if he could come along, say tomorrow. And so it was arranged. Ken thanked Mrs. Donald for her time and assured her that her son would be satisfied. Ken was pleased with the job he'd done. Mrs. Donald was sold. But he hadn't planned on the son. Mechanical objections? What could they possibly be? Well, he'd have to be prepared to meet them all. And as usual, Ken started right away. There was plenty to do. He personally made sure that the demonstrator was spotlessly clean and mechanically perfect. He checked the points he wanted to make. Roominess, flexibility, acceleration, braking, comfort, power, speed, and safety. Since Mrs. Donald was already sold, he'd aim the demonstration at the young Donald. And for a young man, acceleration, speed, and power usually turned the trick. With this in mind, he checked the planned route, visualized it, and planned generally what to say at each point. And finally, he got ready for young Donald's objections. He reviewed all the Buick claims and made himself thoroughly familiar with Packard counterclaim. By next day, Ken was ready. Shrewdly, Ken had them both sit in front with him. He explained that the seat was adjustable, that there was plenty of leg room and body room. As he came to a crossing, he pointed to the advantage of the slender pillar posts and the wide vision windshield as safety factors. In slow moving traffic, Ken showed them how he could slow to about 10 miles per hour and pick up speed without changing gears because extra power made the car highly flexible. Now, very curiously, young Donald sat deadpan. Though Ken tried to draw him out, he failed. It worried Ken, but he hoped the car's performance would answer most of the objections. So, when the light changed, Ken zoomed away, commenting on the swift acceleration with a lick of praise for the new manifold and carburetor. The new Packard engine was given full credit. Then, of course, a big safety factor is in the brakes. Uh, if you hold tight, I'll make a quick stop. Mind you now, this is not an emergency stop, but an ordinary fast stop. As the car came to a fast, smooth stop, Ken re-emphasized the safety factor. He explained that an emergency stop would practically halt the car on a dime. Mrs. Donald commented on how beautifully the car took the rough road. And for young Donald's benefit, Ken talked balanced springing, unsprung weight, and general ride factors. Young Donald said nothing. Ken took the Packard up a steep hill. He pointed out that with the new powerful engine under the hood, it was no effort at all. And still, young Donald was silent. Ken was worried. How could he answer objections if the guy wouldn't talk? Maybe a good burst of speed would loosen his tongue. They were coming to a broad stretch of highway. As Ken started to let her out, he asked them not to look at the speedometer. When he hit 60, he asked them to guess how fast he was going. They both guessed about 50. Well, actually, we're doing 60. But I don't blame you. The car's so powerful and so well built that vibration is eliminated. You can hardly tell you're moving. She'll do over 90, of course. But uh, we won't risk it on this road. Young Donald took the car back over the route. He drove expertly, putting the car through its paces. But still, he said nothing. So Ken decided to dig. Your mother tells me you had some mechanical objection to the car, Mr. Donald. Do you find any fault in the car's performance? No, it wouldn't show on a short stretch. 
You see, I was a pilot in the war, Mr. Mitchell, and I know that most planes used overhead valve engines. They're much more efficient than your L-head engine, you know. Oh, so that was the kind of objection, was it? Ken breathed a sigh of relief. He was mighty glad he'd done some preparation on it. But young Donald would have to be handled very carefully. You're right. Most planes do use overhead valves for good reason. You know, Packard built the Rolls-Royce engine for the P-51. Did you fly one? No, but I had some friends who did. They thought it was a wonderful job. Yes, we built all kinds of engines. And like most car builders, we found the L-head design preferable for cars. When we get back, I have some material that I'd like you to see. And as soon as they got back, Ken talked young Donald's language. He explained why the overhead valves were better for planes. That made the young man feel good. Then Ken showed why the L-head was better for cars. It had to do with different engine speeds, fuel of lower octane ratings, and the turbulence factor as it related to the shape of the combustion chamber. Young Donald was first amazed, then impressed. What's more, the explanation was perfectly sound. So sound that Jim Fallon was amazed. He was talking to Mrs. Donald and listening to Ken with one ear. Where had Ken picked up that kind of information? Wherever Ken had picked it up, it certainly came in handy. As Ken and young Donald came up, Fallon could see it was all over but the shouting. He breathed a sigh of relief. The Donald neighborhood would stay Packard territory. And for the first time, Fallon had an idea that Ken might become a Packard master salesman. And it seemed to Fallon that in all justice, the Donald neighborhood might be safer in Ken's hands than in Prindle's. It would be a shame to hit Prindle like that, though. As Jim looked at the map, wondering what to do, he got an inspiration. Let Prindle keep Gladstone Heights. With the Donalds in line, it was safe Packard territory. Prindle was a good salesman. He knew the rules, he followed them. Let Prindle take care of safe territory. But here was a salesman who not only knew the rules, he knew how to adapt them to particular situations, to particular people. He was nimble-footed enough to dance around the rules if he had to. Say, with a salesman like that, why waste him on safe territory? Packard could spread out to new sections. Here was a whole city much of it untouched. And as Fallon dreamed of new worlds for Packard and for Ken the Conquer, that particular hero was just getting home. When Kay heard the good news, she gave him a hero's reward. She called him Big Shot, and she wasn't quite kidding. Then she said, I'm so glad, darling. Now we'll have time to go out for that suit you need. I saw exactly the suit you want today. It has a conservative gray stripe, it's double-breasted, of course, and it's the most magnificent...